Hi, today I'm joined by editor of Property Investor News, Richard Bowser. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ranger. And what we're going to be covering in this video is a little bit about Richard Bowser, the person and the property investor, the property entrepreneur. Uh, Richard inve invests in property, but he also is editor of Property Investor News magazine. He's been investing in property for more than 20 years. So what we want to get a little bit behind in this video is what are Richard's core principles uh, in terms of investment strategy, uh, what has kept him going and in the game and successful in the game for so long? Uh, because it's very easy to get started in property, but it's quite a different thing to um, maintain that growth consistently and profitably for uh, a duration of time and through all phases in the property market cycle. So Richard, thanks very much Thank you, uh, for joining us. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your first investment property. When and how did you get started? Uh, well, my first property, which was obviously as a, as a homeowner, was all the way back in 1977. So I've been a homeowner and held property in London for 40, 43 years now, which is something to think about. So when was the first buy to let? Early 90s. 19, what yeah. made you sort of get into it? Accidental, pure accidental. Uh, it, was, it was one of those situations where uh, we were looking to move and we decided not to and we held it. So, so you're the classic accident. Yeah, landlord. absolutely. Uh, and at that time, I was working in the international education market and an opportunity came up. So um, we didn't move and I then spent a lot of time on jumbo jets flying around the world, having a, a very nice time, often at other people's expense, um, whilst this property ticked away. What was the light bulb moment that made you think, well, actually, um, it's worth buying another one and doing it again. Okay, yeah, so that, that, that was sort of mid-2000 um, and circumstances changed because I thought, hang on a minute, you know, this has done okay. We've had relatively few problems that hasn't been burnt down, the tenants haven't trashed the property. Um, I've continued to turn up at Heathrow and fly to Australia sometimes once a month and do a lot of travel uh, in, in what was my career at that time. And yeah, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, this, this, this has been a good investment. And it was also at a stage of my life where I needed to think about the long term, like, I'm many, like many people do with property, you're thinking about it as a, as a bit of an alternative pension plan. Uh, and so that was my, my core aim, I was thinking, this has worked, what can I do uh, again? What, how, can I, how, how can it be replicated and maybe do it more often? So you've decided to kind of make um, buy to let a bit of a business, but you've seen a few market cycles mm. since uh, since you since you started doing it sort of professionally. Mm. So what have been, if you like, your core guiding principles that have kept you so consistently growing and expanding that portfolio? The, fundamentally, I, I, I'm a very traditional yield driven, income driven investor. That that's been my abiding principle but also secondly one that would involve me in as little as possible direct day to day so I do single lets and I do them in a part of the country the northeast where um, there has been robust tenant demand um, but I, what I've learned as many people do is, is to refine that uh, acquisition and refine that strategy. So in, in uh, sort of 2001, 2002, I, I was like many people able to achieve sort of 18, 20% gross yield, which in London. Those were the days. <laughs> absolutely. On single <coughs> lets. Now, you know, many people watching this would just laugh at, at that being able to be achieved. But that was the reality then. In areas which, with hindsight, some of those acquisitions I, I would not purchase again. And, and I'm sure many people that, that were looking at those types of opportunities, whether it be in the North East or, or the North West or the North Midlands or, or South Wales, at that time were pursuing similar strategies. But there's a big difference between gross yield and net yield. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that, that perhaps is one of the big learning curves that most people that have done this type of approach would, would very quickly identify. 
you, you've got to look at your gross to net, absolutely, um, and the hassle factor as well, and the cost of the hassle factor, dealing with the hassle factor um, and, and regulation, and we'll, we'll maybe talk about this as well. But, but it grows to net, absolutely. So was it social housing tenants or yes. private tenants? In, in, in that, that, it, to summarise it, yes, I've moved away from the social housing benefit LHA market um, more towards, much more towards private tenants. That's because of the hassle factor, is it? The hassle factor, the regulation, mm. the, uh, uh, the income, the gross income, because of the changes in the way that uh, the government has decided to, or decided, um, that the housing benefit bill is getting out of control um, and, and they need to clamp down that and of course that, that's what's occurred. So rents now in that sector in, in most parts of the country are, are nothing like as favourable as they are or were rather compared to average market rents. What would you say it is about the way you do things that have made you invest consistently in boom or bust stages of the market cycle? Um, well, well, A, just having a, a, a clear idea about what you want to achieve in terms of um, the, the net figure um, <laughs> per month or per year from a given property uh, relative to the, you know, the, the, the cost that are equated to it. Um, and and rec- probably more than anything, recognising the long-term value of holding property from a capital growth perspective. <laughs> Relative to, to yields, have time. you had that in the northeast? In those we sort had of a areas? fantastic upturn between two thousand and two and two thousand and seven. Mm-hmm. So from from mm. a period where you could acquire stock in say two thousand and one at twenty percent gross yield, within seven years you were looking at sixty seven percent gross yield. So when you've um, reinvested and bought further properties, um, have you funded those acquisitions by remortgaging and leveraging up? from the capital gain that you experienced, or have you done it predominantly from investing cash flow, positive cash flow back into new acquisitions? Yeah, combination. And there have been some years when I've not acquired property, but there have been some years when I've acquired more than one. Um, so what's your attitude to sort of debt and leverage? That's, that's probably an age thing. And obviously I'm at a certain stage of, of my life. Um, so as far as debt and leverage. I, I've always preached, you know, a warning that leverage is all very well, particularly in the boom times. It's all very well being highly leveraged as a growth phase occurs. Um, but but contrary, you know, in, in there's a term in the city used about not catching a falling sword. Um, and I think with with you know, as many people have found out in London and South East in the last few years, being highly leveraged um, can can have consequences. No, I mean your whole approach gels very much with mine, and it's it can be described as being boring. Yes. But what I find is that um, boring uh, investors seem to be around twenty years later. Yes. Uh, there is a real problem um, with people that sell too close to the wind by over leveraging and uh, taking out too much debt because there's just no cushion there when the market turns. Yeah. And I know, um, I mean, you must have found that with many of your readers who have kind of sailed too close to the uh, sun, or flown too close to the sun, if you like, yeah. mixing metaphors. But you know what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. I've called it the Icarus syndrome. Yes, that's what, that, that was the guy. Too, <laughs> too, too far, too high, mm. they get too close to the sun, they get their wings burned and they crash. And, and we've seen that most recently in London, the South East, particularly with, with people in the development sector in, in recent years, and we saw it very evidently in 08-09, where we saw an awful lot of people crash and burn who were either long-term rental, or they thought they were long-term rental, and they were doing it on, 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 on yields which were not appropriate. They were too highly leveraged uh, as well because of what had gone on previously in, in terms of what banks allowed. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I refer to it as the elastic band. Mm. People stretch themselves too far. Okay. Yes. Yes. And people. And when times, I think the the other thing that happens is that it depends when people have started, because the the, the market cycle takes decades. Mm. And if you've only started five years ago, you haven't experienced a full cycle. 
So you don't know um, how things can get. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's one, one of the big, big problems with the people who uh, start out and, as you say, stretch that band too far. Yeah. I did an interview um, at, a, at a meeting uh, probably about three years ago now with a young lady who, who I remember it well because it you know, really underlines the point you just what we've just been talking about and, and she'd acquired a property in Walthamstow mm -hmm. in 2014 and then over a two year period that property did very well it went up in value by for, from, from memory around maybe 30% but that was her first investment property and she said I'm you know I've got a large what well, decent chunk of equity now and I said okay well the next move is going to be the one that's going to make a difference to your fundamental long term wealth or you're going to go backwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I said, you need to consider very, very carefully what you're doing because the cycle we just had in that area is going to come around once maybe every, you tell me, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you're not going to be able to repeat that. So you need to go by, you know, go with the principles with that first property, um, and, but just make sure that, that, you know, that second acquisition is going to stand the test of time. And, um, you, you, I mean, I mentioned before you edit Property Investor News. Yes. How, when, when did Property Investor News uh, start? Um, in my head, two thousand and one. In reality, twenty years ago now. Two, two, uh, it's going for twenty years. Sorry, sorry in, in eight, eighteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're coming up to our two hundredth edition. Two hundredth edition. Two hundred. Uh, I mean, many of you will know. I mean, when I recommend people uh, what they read, I recommend people should read Property Week, Property Estates Gazette, the FT at the weekend, and also Property Investor News every month. I see it as a bit of a the FT of the uh, the, the the property world. <laughs> I, I've written the odd article myself yeah, on commercial yeah, property yeah, over yeah. the years, um, but uh, the, the readership um, must have changed over that period. I yes. mean, how would you characterise? The change in the readership over the last five years and going forward? In the last five years, um, what we've seen in the last five years probably is we've seen a number of long-term traditional landlords exit the market because of the tax changes and the, and the way that government has decided to, to clamp down on, on traditional buy to let and its approach. Um, so in the last five years we've seen some of our long-term subscribers sell up or move on or are now very passive sitting on their hands waiting. Mm -hmm. um, We'd seen a new group of people come into the market. We've seen new strategies. Um, I would say people, probably the, the, the biggest change in the last five years, or the two biggest, I would say people getting into small scale property development from five, six years ago, and in the last two or three years uh, away from London. Um, and some of them unfortunately have, have, have you know, not done too well. Um, some of them done very well. The second thing I would say is the whole indirect stroke crowdfunding. Um, people are attracted to crowdfunding. Um, they're attracted to the idea of, of learning through crowdfunding um, and, and putting relatively small chunks of money with property developers. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these have been not very successful investments and some of them have obviously been very successful. In fact, we've got an interview in the February magazine with someone who's a very successful professional investor and uh, that, that is what she does. She invests in, in other people's projects and has done very well from it. Okay, I think I can guess who that person is. Okay, good. <laughs> that, that, that's a good standpoint to do because often people do it from the standpoint of the person raising the finance. Yes. So it'll be very good to see the article from Indeed. the yeah. perspective mm -hmm. of an investor because yeah. it's a completely different skill. Indeed. In, yeah. in many respects. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right, those are two big trends. One, it's become easier to raise funds through the crowd, mm -hmm. but investing in property, there has been a new avenue to invest in property yes. via crowdfunding. Indeed. Um, there's also crowdfunding in terms of ownership as well. Mm -hmm. There are ways of owning commercial property through crowd yes. and also residential yes. portfolios mm -hmm. through the crowd, as well as investing mm -hmm. in developers. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago when you started the magazine, it was Property Investor News. Um, a lot of those investors are now turning into developers, like yes, you said. That, so perhaps you know, it's yeah. property developer news as well. Yeah. No, I, 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 we, we tried not to... I, I had a choice to make when I launched the magazine. and Did I want it to be buy-to-let news or property investor news? And I chose property investor news because I, I knew from my previous publishing 
career that markets change and, and, and strategies change, fashion changes, so we, we, we kept it broad. Um, and it, it's ebbed and flowed in terms of the, of the content. In some years we focused much more on overseas property investments, which was quite a strong trend from sort of 2003 to 2008. We focused in some years more on commercial property investment, I, but generally the, the, the focus has been residential property investment and, as you say, more recently more, probably in the last three or four years, more towards development. Um, and probably I would say, again, the third, to answer your question again on, on, on what trends, I would say certainly commercial property has been something that I've seen more and more of our more experienced subscribers turn towards, mm-hmm. whether that be mixed uh, mixed use um, or, or pure commercial. Um, and then of course commercial development opportunities, permitted development as well. Yeah, And that's where um, a resource like Property Investor News is very um, useful because it's to inform and educate mm. and, and yeah. make people aware of new sort of opportunities. Yes. Um, and I think uh, it used to be a completely different ball game, I think, commercial property from the financing point of view. Mm. But now residential buy to let, because typically people are doing that in limited companies. Mm. Um, yes. Commercial property investment finance has typically been in limited companies yes. anyway. So a lot of the lending, the ways of getting your finance and the rules have mm. kind of leveled out between uh, the two. Yeah. I think um, that, that from, from a perspective of residential property investment, Without question, straightforward buy to let is, 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 is much more complicated in terms of what you need to consider, um, particularly with the tax and, and financing changes of the last few years. But when we look at the rates that are currently available um, of, in your own name um, on finance, it's, it's, it's in, you know, there's incredible rates. I mean, we are at a 300 odd year low in terms of bank base rate, and, and then that's followed through in terms of availability of, of finance and the cost of finance. So I think people need to look very carefully now when they're considering buying in their own name, holding property in their own name, and also holding them in, in LLPs or limited company structures. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just the the rate that you can get. Uh, well, it is very much about the rate you can get uh, and, and the ongoing you know term of that rate. Um, but, but um, also the loan to value, etc. So it's something people really need to, you know, when they are looking at opportunities, they, they need to be talking to a professional, a mortgage broker, who, who really understands the marketplace and the product choice. Yes, yes. So what do you think of the, I mean, we've had the election out the way now, and uh, it's nicely um, uh, positive, I guess. I mean, um, it's, well, it, it's better than the last. Better than the alternative lot on yes, us for I, I property I investment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, now, I mean, I, I've mentioned this in previous videos. I'm very positive about the outlook for property now. I think we've had a lot of things cleared up, and I think we can get back to a, a standpoint where the government gets on and governs, and we get on and do entrepreneurship business, whatever we want to do, yeah. and just assume that those guys are going to do a good job, mm. which is generally what government should be doing, yes. rather than. Giving us, giving us a whole bunch of um, uncertainty. So I've got great plans for the next few years. Um, what about yourself? How, how uh, now that we've got a little bit of certainty with the government mm. out the way, um, what are your sort of plans for the next few years, property wise? Okay, I don't, I don't disagree with you on the points you just made. Uh, we, we have now got clarity. We've got certainty. Clearly, Brexit. There's some, uh, obviously some hardball negotiation uh, ahead, uh, but at least we've got a, you know, we've got a playing field now. Um, which seems to be in, you know, there aren't as many obstacles in our way yeah. as they were at the beginning of, say, 2018, 2019. So the, the, I w- would absolutely agree there's a lot more clarity, more confidence, uh, and I see a relatively positive year ahead. Um, different parts of the country are going through different phases of the local economy and, and what's happening with jobs, etc. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm like you. Um, I'm, I'm reasonably positive. I'm not going to go overboard um, because there are some bigger, there's some bigger stuff outside of, of the UK borders that may have an impact. Uh, um, Mr. Trump's approach to Iran, uh, the conflict, the sort of you know the standoff between the US and China, being two other things that we we might need to to, to consider uh, when we're assessing risk v reward. But when it comes down to property, yeah, I think it's, it's you, 
reasonably positive prospects in, 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 in mind. Um, availability of, of supply and the price that you pay relative to what you can achieve, that's a personal decision relative to your risk profile. Me personally, I'm at a certain stage of my life, mm -hmm. and so you know, for me, it's about um, wanting to always consider what am I prepared to risk relative to um, what am I prepared to achieve. And the older you get, the more sort of cautious perhaps you become. Um, so nothing much is going to change in terms of the fundamental choices that I make. One will be a yield-based investment, the other will be a more long-term capital growth-based investment. And those are the, I'm intending this year to do two purchases. One will be very much in the yield-based investment uh, marketplace, and the other one will be, be very much an investment which will be two, two points. One would be acquiring something which can absolutely have a value add proposition. So I'll be looking to add value to, to that unit, but also with a fundamental view of long-term capital growth. Mm -hmm. And that will be in and around London. Okay. And you've also mentioned to me some legacy planning as well. That yeah. You'll, you'll yeah, be, that, 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 uh, that's, that's also, that, that's tied up with, yeah, yeah, with the yeah. longer term. Yeah. But I think that's a, it's an important point that you raise because when um, people... Uh, come to Baker Street and they meet other investors mm. and all of that and everyone wants to get advice and, and yes. uh, help for their part of the journey. You've always got to bear in mind that your investment strategy um, is very much tailored to you depending on mm. where you are in your stage of your right. journey and also yeah. stage of life. Mm. There's a certain, I remember my strategies in my 20s was completely different Absolutely. to now. Mm -hmm. If you've got nothing to lose, you you, you go and for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so your investment strategy does change in each decade. The the actual yes. goals, if you like, the philosophy does mm -hmm. have to change. My attitude to gearing is completely yes. different now yes. to what it was when I was yeah. Yeah. I've got subscribers, getting started. Yeah, I've got subscribers, property investor news, who, 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 who have a, an inverse view of their age relative to their gearing level. So. Uh, people who, who, you know, in their 20s or early 30s would be happy with, with being you know, 80, 85% geared, but are now in their 50s and 60s and they want to get their gearing south of 40%. Yes, 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 yes. And I think it's very, very important to know at which stages in your journey to kind of um, shift gear a little sure. bit yeah. um, and, and how to shift that gear. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting to hear your point of view on that and how you've done that over the decades mm -hmm. as well. Now, I haven't told you I was going to do this. I've just thought of it now. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a, you edit Property Investor News, so I want to get a sort of quick fire your views on some of the investment strategies that are out there. So rent to rent. For, for someone getting started in property, what do you think? What's your take on rent to rent? Look, it's a viable strategy if done correctly and you abide by what you need to abide by. And, and that would be making sure that your, your customers, your tenants are in a property where it has appropriate insurance and appropriate mortgage relative to its usage. That would be absolutely my number one take on that. Uh, the second thing would be to ensure that as far as rent to rent is concerned, the, the numbers add up. And I think a lot of the hype around rent to rent is, is not justified by the reality. Um, and, that, and that's been particularly in, in the context of the last year or so, where the changes to HMA, re, HMO regulations um, mean now that a certain a, a one or two rooms in each property will not abide by, by minimum room sizes. That's a good point. Qualify. And often people's yeah. figures are done on full occupancy basis. Correct. And, you so know, it's all very well saying, yes, I'm going to rent this property, I'm going to convert mm -hmm. it into a five bedroom HMO, um, but that's all very well. But if now that fourth room, which might be the profit, mm -hmm. can no longer be legally used as a, as a multi-let, as a HMO, then unfortunately, you know, you don't have a viable strategy anymore. Okay, I've got some links on, some videos on uh, rent to rent. Uh, which you can watch uh, up there. So, um, uh, uh, lease options. Lease options as an investment strategy for people getting started. Hype or reality? What's your take? Um, I'd say there's probably a lot more hype than reality. Options are absolutely a fantastic strategy in, in, in commercial property and, and residential. Applying a lease to it, yes. Uh, I think, as I mentioned to you earlier, I've got a subscriber who, who's got a good track record with lease options. Um, but every single one of those 
was challenged. Mm -hmm. Every single one was challenged. By the vendor by the who vendor. didn't want the to sell. The person who sold the property on a lease option initially, and then the option was exercised and the property was acquired by the person that took out the option. Every single one of those was challenged. And fortunately for this individual, um, he employed a very good solicitor. And so therefore, every single challenge was rebuffed in court. But my take on them, yes, it's a viable strategy, but be very aware that, that you will likely be challenged and therefore you need to make sure that your option agreement and your acquisition is, is as bulletproof as possible. And um, the final thing I wanted to take on is, I, you know, I'm thinking of uh, quitting my day job and making my riches in deal packaging. Uh, what, what's your take on deal packaging? Is that the source to financial freedom? Um, well, there are there are people who, who, who make a living out of it. I, I would say, based on my observations of some of the deal packaging opportunities that have been bombarding my inbox over the years, that, that there are an awful lot of people out there that present themselves as deal packages that, quite frankly, haven't got a clue what a deal is. <laughs> yes. In That's the cool. real world. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I think it's. I think it's easier said than done because I, I think you're right. I mean, I think a lot of the time a deal is packaged as a simple lead from right move, yes. and the person investing in the deal is just as capable yes. of looking at right move as the next yeah. guy. That's yeah. the thing. Um, I think it's been a very enjoyable discussion. It's been <laughs> great to get behind um, Richard Bowser, the investor as well as the editor of Property Investor News, what's kept him going and, and surviving and thriving in the business over the last 20 years, and what's keeping him excited about the investment opportunities going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Richard. Thank you, um, Jeff. What's in the next edition of, uh, this video is gonna go out in the next week or so, so what's oh, in the okay. next uh, edition of Property uh, Investor yeah. News? Well, there'll be an interview with a commercial property operator who's not sitting too far away from me at this moment in time, uh, talking <laughs> about uh, uh, commercial office and, and, and uh, making uh, uh, good investments in that respect. Um, uh, 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 we're also looking at uh, indirect op uh, investing opportunities this year. We'll be doing our annual historic ratios uh, report where oh, we that's look pretty at, interesting, yes. uh, we get a lot of good feedback on this. Uh, so every year in our January edition, we look very detailed analytically at where uh, the main asset classes are at and what you should be considering on a historic uh, comparison basis. Um, so a lot, a lot of people comment positive on that. Um, lots of other stuff. I, I can't uh, the, uh, <laughs> say exactly, but that, that's certainly some of the, the, the material. That we're well, it's a good read, and if you're serious about property, it should be one of the magazines, should be one of the journals you subscribe to, and we'll put a link in the description below. Thanks for joining us in this video. Until next time, oh, make sure you subscribe and hit that like button because it really helps us out on YouTube and see you guys in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. If you're not a subscriber, what are you waiting for? Subscribe, hit the bell icon. As soon as we upload, we'll let you know. And enjoy these. They're all dedicated to helping you be more successful in property. Happy investing.